Thank you for joining me today to hear about this passion project of ours. Library staff are consistent problem solvers, squeezing every ounce of service and experience out of the resources at your disposal. After this, I only hope that you're going to be looking at your everyday surroundings with an even more inventive eye. By day, I'm a design principal at JRA Architects, a firm with 75-year legacy and 30-plus professionals working from offices in Louisville and Lexington, Kentucky. I'm the firm's civic design lever, engaging with public clients to find creative ways to stretch their resources further and build a more engaging, sustainable experience for their communities. We've designed the most ambitious libraries in the state over the past nine years in partnership with the Louisville Free Public Library and fellow designers MSNR and MKSK Studios. Despite the fact that the three projects are basically the exact same size and functions, each drew unique inspiration from its context to create an irresistible experience at every step. We found ways to inspire patrons to park further from the building and leverage mundane site constraints like a detention basin into a focal point of sustainable development. We've made the most of everyday materials like drywall, acoustic ceiling, and metal siding to deliver surprising results on reasonable budgets. We've sparingly invested in adaptable features like access flooring and operable walls so that the library can evolve inexpensively for years to come. At first glance, you wouldn't know that the picture on the left is in the middle of a parking lot. We've embraced precious site features like the mature forest at the South Central Library and gone to great lengths to use the construction to celebrate the beauty of the trees in a variety of ways. What started as an investment in art by our local council person was instead spun into a hands-on community arts program where dancers, poets, and visual artists offer public education programs every month, allowing patrons to access and then apply new creative skills. Our most recent project goes even further to make the collection and hands-on experiences irresistible. A first impression of face-out materials invites patrons to explore the collection and find the perfect space and seat just for them. Stacks and furniture are paired with flooring and lighting to create a variety of functional rooms without walls, while careful collection planning allowed a reduction in building area and more than offset the cost of the exterior canopy that shades the building and offers another venue for outdoor activities. The lessons from those projects are foundational in what comes next. Every day, you're trying to find new and creative ways to engage your patrons, and your only limitations, overwhelming as they tend to be, are time, money, and imagination. It's a never-ending challenge, but you may already have resources on hand that just need a catalyst to realize their additional potential. As one does, uh, I fall into discoveries on the web from time to time. The range of remarkable temporary art is a rabbit hole I can highly recommend and have fallen into uh, far too often. For today, I wanted to share two that were hard to ignore, but interestingly inspire the opposite reaction for me. The first is Andreas Amador, an artist who uses beaches as his canvas to create remarkably beautiful patterns with just a simple rake. His geometric patterns are pretty phenomenal, but I'm partial to his more organic creations, which are often surreal and truly fascinating. Another artist whose YouTube features will vaporize a half hour in a blink uh, is Simon Beck, who's partial to untouched snow. His work is simply a pattern of sh snowshoe tracks, which, when seen from the right angle and with the right sunlight, are just wild. Other than the shoes, his only tool is a simple orienteering compass. And yet, these are beautiful, but basically off limits. They're in faraway places, intentionally selected to be unencumbered by people. Now, this is of course the architect in me longing, longing for these beautiful things to be enjoyed by other humans, ideally on the ground rather than from a drone's eye view or adjacent mountain ridge. And what if they had more durability and resiliency than the next high tide, snowfall, or cloudy day? So enter 2020. Necessity is the mother of invention, and while we all knew it, Living a life apart from one another only reinforced the value of shared experience for all of us. We've each tested the limits of our own ingenuity to survive this last year. For me, it begged the question of whether there was a way to seek out that social connection with the wider world, but at a safe distance. Of all the random things, my daughter's overgrown middle school field just happened to be in the right place at the right time, begging for an intervention. Dreamed up on the driveway with my neighbor one evening, 
our guerrilla landscaping partnership was born. Rather than wait for permission, we opted for the uh, beg forgiveness track this time. Uh, two people, two push mowers, a few gallons of gas, and no particular plan, but we got to work one Saturday morning. The first timer record was just over six minutes, and we had some that clocked in well over 20 minutes, including this poor guy in red here. Our lines weren't so straight, and my mower nearly gave its life for the cause, but we had our maze. In the end, the investment was incredibly low. Through the rest of this presentation, you'll actually see that I've included cost stats in the bottom corner for reference. What was wild after mowing for four hours was that for most points of view, you couldn't really tell that we had done anything. Uh, just that little bit of overgrowth made for a surprisingly immersive experience. This maze lasted a little over two weeks and got a maintenance mow about halfway through. So the realizations here for us uh, as we uh, spent that time mowing, it, it couldn't help but let our minds wander. Uh, a few things kind of began to crystallize. This was a great way to get some exercise. Obviously, we all spend uh, however many countless hours uh, over the course of a year out mowing our yards. So uh, using that as an opportunity for exercise was a really um, you know, fun realization. Um, the, just the reality that this was an intuitive problem-solving opportunity that kids could engage with on their own terms. You didn't have to set the rules for them. You basically just had to point them toward the start or the finish and say, all right, find your way to the other end. That uh, ability to offer play as a, an intuitive canvas for imagination was really excellent. The fact that this was age neutral, other than the frustration, which seemed to be much more heavily on the adult side than the kid side, this was truly age neutral. We saw everybody from two year old to 82 year old enjoy this and often with their family members. So the barrier for entry was virtually non-existent as long as you had the ability to walk. The ability to have safe wandering, which as a parent of younger kids certainly is, is something that I've come to grips with that you don't necessarily want your kids just wandering off over the course of two acres uh, if you're worried about them getting into trouble or finding themselves in an unfortunate circumstance. By having the grass be so low, uh, actually let uh, parents sit on the sidelines and let their kids wander. Uh, and there's something to that, to the notion of intuitive problem solving and play and, and imagination that having the freedom to wander is, is truly something that really is an engaging thing for younger people. And then probably most importantly for you being the kind of caretakers of public investment is there's no lasting footprint. Um, this got mowed down two and a half weeks afterward and within a couple weeks it was back to what it looked like previously. Beyond that, we also had our minds wandering on what's next. Um, you know, could this be educational and perhaps even cross-pollinate between different creative worlds? Is there the possibility for public institution partnerships, say a school where you might get a poetry class and a graphic design class and a drafting class all together and do uh, collaborative learning and collaborative uh, projects that really do mimic the reality of the real world where you're having to work with others that uh, are coming from different backgrounds? Maybe this is even an opportunity to fundraise. Is there a possibility that there's money to be made out there and do some public good along the way? The fact of it being experiential, engaging the public, special community events, outdoor learning environments. The fact that there's the no-mo areas that tend to pop up on the edges of people's properties. There are always these kind of leftover spaces uh, on properties that literally are forgotten or ignored. Is that a possibility for us to take advantage of those so that we're really not even bothering the kind of quote-unquote front yard areas versus the ability to have some high visibility. You know, there is real value in having these things be intuitive to visitors so that they understand there's something there to be engaged. The reality of scaling this to every circumstance, I'm sure not everybody has two acres of you know, pristine grass just laying around, not doing anything for them. So just the reality that we might have to apply this uh, problem solving, this, this uh, creative outlet uh, at different scales. Could we make this as inexpensive as humanly possible? You know, push ourselves to spend as little money as possible to really prove out, really beta test the fact that this is something that was super impactful for very low investment. In the end, it's about the engagement, not the maze. You know, yes, this is one way that this could have played out, but this could just as easily have been uh, some different kind of labyrinth. This could have been um, little pockets of outdoor collaborative space, but we found that this was a way to really engage the public intuitively and inexpensively. 
Our nearby high school had a no-mow area, just like what we were talking about and, and hoped might uh, be our next challenge. So right along the back side of their property, there were these, you know, between five and seven acres of just untouched land that's basically left to grow wild. And this was the perfect lo location for our next test case. This time we did get permission. And, you know, again, you can see on the screen, the question of topography and graphic design was something that we also wanted to engage in this next challenge to see how far we could push ourselves. Like many suburban high schools, this is a sprawling campus. You can see they have about 47 acres of property, but the, the thing that really stood out to us is when you consider um, how well its property is being utilized, a diagram like this is pretty instructive that there's a lot of room for creativity. In this case, you can see in green how the leftover land not being used for buildings, pavement, or fields, like uh, sports fields, is over half the property's area. And almost a third of that open space is typically left unmowed, which was ready-made for our intervention. We found a few basic steps, uh, followed a few basic steps to test the new ambitions. The first was incorporate a recognizable graphic, in this case, the well-recognized stylistic Atherton A of the, the school's logo. We really wanted to map out a concept ahead of time this time to uh, increase the density of the paths and make the best use of this reduced amount of land. And this was just a matter of grabbing an aerial view off Google Maps and using the listed scale that was down in the bottom right hand corner to draw a very simple 10 foot by 10 foot grid across the site. In a later project where the tree canopy obscured this aerial view, we used a run mapping app uh, to just trace the boundary. Instead, we basically walked to the perimeter of it and then uh, exported that image to, uh, to Photoshop, did the same deal with the 10-foot uh, grid. And 10-foot has been really good as a grid dimension as that's about four average human steps. Um, and these paths typically need to be about two steps apart from one another to see the boundaries and, and not uh, get confused with what's, what is a path and what's a dead end. Since we wanted the logo's straight lines to stand out, we doubled the widths of those paths that you see here in blue. And then we also opted to just create as intentionally a curvy maze with the rest of the intervention as possible to really make those straight lines stand out. This is just tracing paper laid over that gridded photo. I mean, there's no magic to it. You can see the whiteout that's there. You can see pencil lines that um, inevitably had a ton of eraser marks that have been washed away but you know there was real value in just figuring this out by hand and you know again within an hour uh, we had a, a concept that more or less we followed throughout you know really as long as we had the winning path mapped first dead ends don't have to necessarily match this path verbatim it's really just a matter of ensuring that the, the winning path stays intact once we deployed on site it was really a simple matter of a couple very basic tools like uh, a string line to uh, keep our lines straight where we need them to and to give us a basic layout uh, that we were able to trace and then work from. And you can see in the video, this is another scene from that video at the top of the presentation that quickly gives you a sense for how you know extensive this maze ended up being and hopefully how captivating it was to experience. You know, in the end, the big point here was this was cheap, this was lo-fi, and this was replicable. We really were, you know, felt empowered coming out of this one that we could take this and then push its boundaries even further. Since this was about the same kind of uh, growth that we had at the first uh, spot, you know, could we take it in more extreme directions? So the first one to test was an even more wild experience. In this case, this was a uh, site on River Road right near downtown Louisville. It's in the floodplain, so it's basically been left for the past several years to just grow wild. So we were working our paths around the existing tree canopy, and you can see just the awesome shade trees that were all over the property, and then literally circling the little groups of baby trees. We used it as an opportunity also to clear you know, invasive species as we were going through. And by doubling the widths of the paths you see here, it made it more safe feeling. You know, we didn't have the line of sight that you had at the previous one, so a uh, feeling of safety certainly for parents was ultimately very critical. We then pushed the boundary the other direction. Could you be in a lawn? You're seeing uh, Briarwood Elementary School in Bowling Green, working with Warren P County Public Schools to find a way to engage their students in the environment in a more meaningful way, which improves student outcomes, helps with conflict resolution, was a really awesome 
a test case for them and for us. You know, this is their central courtyard. This is a space that's used every day heavily by their students and staff. You know, could you make this lawn something more? Could you really push it to perform for them in multiple ways and be something unexpected and uh, thrilling? So you see here the, the two sketches that we had done for them initially, just to play out a couple different scenarios. You see the orange is the winning path, the blue is the, uh, the series of dead ends. And they opted for the more condensed, uh, compact, you know, kind of conventional right angle maze because that made the best use of the space. This is only about a half acre, and yet getting through the winning path still takes, you know, if, you're, if you know what you're doing, uh, still takes uh, at least six to seven minutes. It's not overwhelming, but it is a bit of a challenge, uh, and certainly for some probably is more of a challenge. With my partner at the Warren County Public Schools, whose focus is on, you know, students' mental health and well-being, you know, this was a perfect test case for them to see if this could be a supplement to their mental health and physical education offerings. That this was a, a place for teachers to be able to practice mindfulness techniques with their students, you know, to come out here and, and very carefully explore the space, you know, and, and get in touch with their senses. You know, the potential for it to be alternate alternative discipline, you know, the principal was really excited to be able to take kids that were in his office for disciplinary reasons out instead and just take a walk in the maze, use that to actually diffuse situations, improve outcomes, and potentially reduce the amount of time that students were in his office. So that was a you know, unexpected thing that came from him that I was really excited to learn was uh, another use for this. And then they used this for staff team building as well which is just great that it was, again, multi-generational. This wasn't just about the kids, it was about the teachers too. So looking beyond there, that obviously pushed the two ends of the spectrum, you know, the super overgrown and the super manicured. And, you know, mazes in the lawn let us be out front, which that last one got us really excited because then we could be in the front yard, uh, really lure people in. This isn't available to every case, and certainly in the case of libraries, I'm sure the majority of you don't have at least a half acre, which is about the minimum that it takes to do a fairly meaningful maze like you've seen. So it kept us imagining where else we could go. So this is an aerial view of the Lexington Village Branch Library in Kentucky, which is about to be remade as a new heart of this dense urban neighborhood. This is likely a more common scenario, a public location, limited land, never enough parking, constrained exterior maintenance budget, I'm sure. And, you know, so this seemed like an excellent test case for us to just go through the thought experiment of how would we ap uh, approach this if we were trying to engage with this institution. One of the great things is they do have this opportunity of a nearby park in a neighborhood that is uncommonly pedestrian oriented. So this half mile, this, you know, seven to eight minute walk is really not anything unavailable or unrealistic to expect the public to engage with if we could overcome that distance. When talking with the branch manager, she could imagine engaging the public for special events in the park, and maybe that means that you actually have, you know, we've shown you previously, you know, a traditional field maze, but, you know, getting you from A to B, is it possible that you could have some kind of special event that was as simple as just a story walk, for instance, just tons of great examples, super inexpensive, where you're just using yard signs, and the fact that this is a, a heavily bilingual uh, neighborhood, is there the opportunity to even play with, with language here too, that one side might tell one story and the other side might tell either the same story in the other language or an, a, an entirely unique story. So it's a both coming and going experience. And then the fact that there's the pavement, front stoop, this is undercover. There's the opportunity for concrete to actually be cleaned with something as simple as a power washer and become something special. And then the reality that all of you do have is the value of your interior. You know, can you play off of things as simple as the pattern on your carpet to create something that was uh, temporary but memorable? This first scenario, this front stoop, the first impression you have of your space is before you even get inside. You know, was there the opportunity to create something super cheap and super durable? And in this case, it's actually probably more durable than any of the other items I've shown you so far because it's not going anywhere. You know, it'll take months if not longer than that to uh, to wear away or to get dirtied up again but unless you are on a strict maintenance schedule of power washing your front sidewalks you know there are some really amazing things you can do with uh, a power washer be it you know something like the maze or something like public art or the bottom right corner is actually the thing that i was most excited about thinking uh, thinking through this was 
you know, could you have an event where one weekend families came and created a some kind of template you know, that you see there in the white, and, and then come back the next week and either, I assume most, most likely staff, uh, have actually branded the patchwork quilt of these different templates onto the concrete. So it's a semi-permanent creation that might actually be something that's both a personal touch that pe puts people in, uh, you know, really engages them with the, the space, you know, this community collage type attitude. Or is there even the opportunity that this could go beyond that and be a source of revenue for uh, for the library that you could actually have a sponsor, that you could have uh, op uh, further opportunities for fundraising or dedication that aren't permanent. You're not paying for plaques and mounting them and all of that. You know, really this is something that maybe you wipe the slate clean at the end of summer every year and then the next spring you have a new blank canvas to, to start with again. And then that fact that inside this could truly just react to the space that you have. You know, in this case, this was just a snapshot photo uh, of the interior of the children's collection. And using something as simple as painter's tape or, you know, perhaps a slightly larger investment you see in the bottom right corner, uh, which is uh, carpet protection that's usually used for like construction projects or moving, you could deploy those for fairly low cost. And really, there's a very small barrier for entry in terms of installation. It's pretty straightforward and intuitive how to put these together as long as you have the design. So in terms of planning, again, I just started the stopwatch to see how long it would take me to go from this snapshot to the finished solution. In the upper right, you see the original snapshot. Uh, literally in the bottom right, uh, I'd use Photoshop to kind of flatten out that area that was visible there, create my connected dot pattern. And again, with just the tracing paper and a few Sharpies, you can see the winning path in blue, the dead ends in pink, and then literally just laid it back over the space to create that rendering you saw on the previous page. About an hour, uh, obviously this is where we would really want to engage with you and would really want to offer this service at no cost to you because this is where we really see it growing to something more that you know this is a small investment for us it's super fun for us and we realize it might be a little bit of an, an intimidation to people that wouldn't be familiar with this or might not be ready to take on the responsibility of all doing all these other steps we would be happy to help and this then lets us engage in any way that if you can just send us a snapshot we can create something and get it back to you and then you deploy it however you see fit when you see fit and as often as you'd like so could you go beyond it the fact that this probably is more applicable to a school for instance but hard surfaces do you have tile do you have hardwood somewhere do you have laminate flooring somewhere you don't have to have carpet to pull this off you know the fun of a space like a gym where you can get up on the bleachers and actually see down from above see the layout of this space Again, using something as simple as like a, a floor protection that's readily available, it's fairly inexpensive. And then all of a sudden, this is not, again, hampering the use of the gym in any way. It's actually adding a whole nother function to the space without sacrificing its fundamental function. And, you know, if you're using something like blue tape, now all of a sudden you're talking about doing it for something like $20 of actual uh, material cost. So I love this video. If you haven't seen it before, this is Powers of Ten by the Eames Studio. It was an architecture firm. Uh, that was really famous in the for their industrial design and their industrial architecture. And this just plays through the reality of um, thinking about this this world that we're in at multiple scales, and and you know it, was, it seemed apt here because all of the things I've shown you up until now are still things that had to be experienced on foot. You know they were large enough scale that um, they weren't handheld, and maybe there's an opportunity here for there to actually be something on a smaller scale that we can create an even more engaging experience. Here's the, the test case. Can we create something that's literally stationary that maybe even engages student age kids to stretch their minds, you know, work on fine motor skills, all those childhood skills that we're trying to build through play typically. Could we use something like this program to actually engage them? Simple materials, you know, this is just an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, but just the connect the dot kind of exercise just different colored markers and again trying to problem solve your way through it but without having to actually move so it's totally accessible and totally available to anybody the fact that kids want to get down on the ground and you know get their imaginations going could it be within an arm's reach could you have a maze that was printed on some kind of resilient material that could be dry erase markered on so one day it's a, a matchbox car map the next day it's a basis for your lego table 
And the third day might be a tapestry that you hang on the wall and kids can do a maze with dry erase markers. Again, something that's adaptable and inexpensive and really plays to the imagination and, and a variety of experience so that it doesn't get stale. Every time somebody visits, it might be something new. As the kids get older, they want to be working on their own. Maybe scaling up is an, an additional feature of a multi-purpose activity wall. Here you'd figure out the winning path maybe with a dry erase marker and then have to create a magnetic gear contraption along the winning path perhaps. And then to take a digital makes it basically projectable anywhere. Is there a community movie night where the intermission has a billboard sized maze that's projected on the side of your library that people can try to solve with laser pointers? This thing that you see on the screen it was just a smart board. Could you create a whole series of engagement apps that all of a sudden are available to your patrons anytime, anywhere, just through a device. So many fun ways that this could be deployed with very minimal resources. I mean, the number of uh, free mazes on the internet is basically infinite, but again, to be able to generate something like this in, in an hour or two, this is actually one that I did within a couple hours that was radial. We know it's very easily accessible, that we can custom um, generate these for you and let you run with them, see how far it takes you. And then beyond that, how can we take this program directly into your materials? This is the diagram of the Choose Your Own Adventure book, but it would be a really fascinating maze, especially if the kids could experience the story while literally traversing its framework. Now this is something I lifted directly off the internet, and right off the bat, there are so many different ways you could take this where it could be just a monochromatic maze, you could still have the color involved, you could even challenge kids to find their way to either an ethical or moral outcome in the story or create dead ends that weren't expected in the book. And literally, now all of a sudden, you're living, you're walking through a story. And again, where could that take you? We don't know yet. You know, but this could be everywhere from something handheld to something walkable and be really remarkable. You know, could it even be a summer reading program opportunity where it's part of this being summer reading list and then all of a sudden they can walk it at last week before school starts perhaps. The ability to tie this into more conventional academic exercises like learning multiplication tables. And you're a resource to the community for additional educational resources. Can this be more fun? Can you be the place that has fun ways to engage with the material? There's an opportunity here for supplemental resources that have things as simple as a maze where you're learning multiples of three or any number. And again, that's just a photocopy and, and off we go. And maybe it's no maze at all. As we start coming back together, can we leverage these outdoor spaces as multi-purpose amenities, a place to gather, a place to create, a place to explore? We've begun engaging with our local Walden School here in Louisville on a plan to create more immersive outdoor learning spaces in what has always been just a mown lawn. And I can't think of a place more appropriate than something that's trying to eschew Emersonian ideals than trying to return a lawn to a more natural environment and engage students in a more meaningful way in their environment. So, you know, again, something as simple as chopping a, a log, you know, perhaps there are outdoor classrooms surrounded by a labyrinth or a maze or a wandering path that, that takes you through different environments, different shade qualities. As I mentioned earlier, nearly everything you've seen was accomplished for next to no, up, no upfront cost using conventional household equipment. If you want to mow a wilderness, I would recommend the bush hog you see on the left, but otherwise a mower will almost always work uh, for something lower than that. That string trimmer, the second picture there, basically just a weed whacker on wheels has been my MVP tool as it cuts tall grass just as easily as lawn and uses a fraction of the gas that a conventional mower does. So basically where we were the first maze using conventional mowers and having to go over uh, every spot at least three times. With the string trimmer, it's basically guaranteed that you're only going to go over a spot two times. You go through with the string trimmer and then follow with the lawnmower and you're on your way. I can't emphasize the last image enough given your positions as there's a world where you might engage your friends members or other volunteer forces so that it's not a direct liability or staff responsibility for your system or maintenance effort for your staff either. There are people like me out there everywhere that are just waiting for that spark, like you know, try to touch on throughout this uh, presentation, to engage in what you're doing, the, the meaningful contribution you're making to your communities, and hopefully give back in, in some way that makes the library a more engaging place to be. So what comes next? 
we'll see where this next year's takes us. We're currently arranging a partnership between Louisville's public schools and local architectural community to have a maze weekend where firm partners have a school assigned to them uh, you know, in different corners of the city and have an open house event where all of a sudden we'd have 10, 12 mazes mowed on the same weekend, a map that's distributed through all the local public school, email and, and text blasts, and now all of a sudden it's an opportunity for these three destinations, even when they're offline for the summer, to really be ways for the community to engage one another. You can see the three stars there. Those are the high schools we've already begun engaging, and you know, obviously Atherton already has had a few mazes, but we're really trying to canvas the entire community and, and bring this to any school or any institution that's interested. You know, Again, this is not something we're trying to force on people, but there are people out there that have really gotten excited about what we're trying to do. We're working with Ball State University, uh, my alma mater, which has the unique responsibility, if you've seen in the national news over the past year or two, of actually running their local public schools. They took over Muncie Community Schools, and in an effort to partner with the College of Design, who already has student groups, volunteer organizations, engaging with those schools directly, you know, could we actually, for this instance here, you see the highlighted quad right outside the College of Architecture in the heart of campus. You can see the bell tower there. This is the center of campus. Could you put this in the front yard of campus, get the students excited, but then also bring in the administrators of the various schools and get them excited about this program and then basically hand off this knowledge to the students to run with it and kind of make it theirs and let it perpetuate. The students are always coming through. The, these organizations will stay there forever. Why not let this be something that's a living experience and share this with as many people as possible? We continue to push our previous partners to consider even more exciting creations, like the Storm Basin Parks in every corner of Louisville. Signature locations like the base of the Big Four Bridge, which give you an aerial view for everybody. And hybrid cross-country learning and play environments with our partner in Bowling Green. What you see there on the right is actually the courtyard of the school we mowed just last fall. But what's exciting is that main property has this wonderful backyard space that will be just a spectacular opportunity to, again, explore topography. There's a, a small creek bed through there, and all kinds of really wonderful tree cover that is a really awesome opportunity to create both outdoor learning environments and potentially even you know, nature walks and other things beyond just uh, doing the maze. This is admittedly a bit of a leap from where we are today, but my personal dream is to spend the last portion of my career creating an experience as remarkable as City Museum of St. Louis. If you haven't been, you have to go. It is inspiring, challenging, occasionally claustrophobic, and just undeniably fun. The picture on the right is an installation in the Smithsonian from a couple years ago. I can't help but imagine something like this, made from perhaps recycled materials and housed within an eccentric abandoned factory building somewhere in one of the cities in the region. It's so fun to think about and you know, so much potential to be someplace that could be truly engaging to the public. and a remarkable destination and landmark in the community at large. For the time being, however, I wanted to thank everybody for having me here today. Uh, and even if you're ultimately not in the market for anything you saw here today, I hope that this will have helped you find inspiration in your familiar surroundings and perhaps take a chance to connect with your communities in an unexpected and fun way. Certainly invited to scan the QRs on the screen or follow the, the links to the website or emails to learn more about JRA and the work we do as well as the Maze homepage where you'll find links to connect in all the ways we do these days. We're up for just about any challenge and incredibly interested in hearing how the spirit of this project could be even more applicable to the work you do. Thank you so much for joining me, and I'm happy to answer questions you might have.